Welcome, everyone. We are very excited to have Ursula present about her favorite topic, <laughs> the zoo diet. It's obvious that we are surrounded by animals, but we often take that for granted. There's a whole mythology. There is so much to understand between these celestial influences and the world of nature. So the reason we decided to uh, share this um, with all of you is because this series of events, including this first session, and there will be four more that Ursula will be uh, elaborating on very soon. But it is ahead of Linda Tucker's North American tour. Linda Tucker is a conservationist who works with the white lions. And the white lions are known in, in the African uh, continent, especially in South Africa, as being mythological beings, even though they are physical in our on our planet, they only recently came back to the planet. The first photograph of a white lion was in 1975. So they disappeared for centuries. They were known only in legends and known to be reincarnations of kings, guardian angels. And it is now when we are at the dawn of the Aquarius age that they are returning. Now, I'm saying on purpose Aquarius age, but in reality, it is the Leo Aquarius age. It's an axis because the Aquarius age represents where the sun is aligned at the March equinox, which is the spring in the Northern hemisphere. And so it's shifting from a being aligned with a constellation of Pisces to the constellation of Aquarius. And that's happening, you know, now pretty much. We are in that overlapping zone. But we are so North Hemisphere centric that we forget that the spring in the Southern Hemisphere is in September now. So we just had our equinox and the the sun rises against the constellation of leo in the spring of the southern hemisphere so this is why these ages are actually an axis and one sign becomes important as it emerges in the northern hemisphere and the other sign emerges in the Southern Hemisphere. And of course, the white lions are in South Africa, which is the Southern Hemisphere. So Linda Tucker is going to be in North America and she will speak about not only the conservational aspect, but about the mythology and how it relates to astrology. Because one of her teacher, Credo Mutwa, spoke about how the lions came from the stars and how there are particular star systems that they are associated with. And we have done extensive research on when they were born and looked at the charts and the alignments. And it's very, very extraordinary you know it is something that will blow your mind literally 
it is so uh, incredibly important and, and perfectly aligned astrologically. So I would like to um, you to take note of several events that will be organized with Linda Tucker. Um, this the one that you're seeing here is going to take place at Omega Institute, and this is upstate New York. It's a retreat center that is well known for hosting spiritual events, including, you know, the Deepak Chopra and um, Brian Wise with reincarnation. And so we're having every year an astrology conference at Omega. And it's, it's a one track conference. It's a smaller conference, but it's immensely successful because it has heart, it's in nature. And we combine this time, this mythological aspect of the lions with astrology. So Linda Tucker is going to be the special guest. And we're going to speak about this Leo Aquarius age and how it works for us personally. You know, what are the timing? How do these ages work? across the timeline it's a 26,000 year cycle so we're going to have um the meanings of the age and then other speakers are going to speak about uh, the sacredness of nature the royal stars it's a very rich program and that's happening june 7 to 9 like i said upstate new york uh, the full program and registration will begin at the end of this month. The other important events that are happening with Linda Tucker is that she's going to visit Mexico and will start her journey mm -hmm. at the Biodiversity Museum Conference on May 22nd and 23rd, 2024, hosted by Ursula. And so she will begin this journey in Mexico City, and it will be the meeting of the white lions with the jaguar. Following that, um, Linda is going to be in Sedona, where we're going to organize an immersion also in the Red Rocks, where she's going to lead a two, three day workshop immersion. So Ursula, you know, was very enthusiastic about everything. And she said, I would like to present this, uh, this um, workshop on the Zudaya because it obviously involves lions and the sign of Leo and the age of Leo Aquarius. But it also, you know, supports the conservation of the white lions. So you are invited to to make donations you know this first session is free however if ursula has a lot more in store and she's going to present this program in spanish in english and mind you she's doing this you know um as a as a devotional gift She's not charging money for herself, but the money that she will raise will go towards the conservation of the white lions because even though they are so sacred and important to our times, there are very, very few of them in the wild. And as you can imagine, a lot of threats from hunters, from the animal trafficking world, you know, um, it is, is an ongoing battle to preserve this heritage. So Ursula, in her unconditional giving, is offering these workshops so that, you know, we, she does, we do our little, 
share to support this uh, important spiritual program. So thank you and handing the mic to you. Thank you. Let me share my screen. So some questions. Um, will the Omega Conference be recorded? Not at this point, no. The conference itself is in person. This presentation will be recorded on the Zoo Dayak and will be available, you know, um, for your own viewing at your own time. Uh, however, the Omega, yes, is in person. There's a lot of ceremonial aspects that, you know, do benefit from being in person. It's also in nature, etc. cetera. Um, some people have asked whether it's, you know, it can be uh, live streamed, but so far the, you know, Omega hasn't approved that. So unfortunately at this point, it's, it's requiring a pilgrimage. Thank you, Ursula. Okay, thank you very much. I'm so happy and thrilled to share all this investigation I have done. And I only want to say that also for Mexicans, the Yaguars are also representing gods. The, it's the most important animal we have in Mexico. So the, the this conference that Linda is going to give together with researchers, scientists, because it's the museum, the, the university museum, uh, where she is going to be, uh, well, part of this incredible staff that's going to be speaking about conservation. And also the, the Yawa people in Mexico, they know very, very closely Linda and her work and what uh, my intention was also that all the research that Linda has done in Africa, she can share it in Mexico too. Al although in Mexico, they also have done a lot of wonderful things around the Yaguars and not only around the Yaguars, there is also a man that's incredible that's going to be part of the exhibition because we are going to have also an art exhibition and his name is uh, Jacobo Ángeles. He makes beautiful alebrijes and he has uh, also a conservation for this uh, copal tree from where the, the alebrijes are done. What is an alebrije in Mexico? What is the meaning of the alebrije? Is that whenever you are born, the first animal that is close to the baby, that's the guardian animal of that the, that baby throughout life. So um, if you want later, I can share with you uh, like um, a, a book of his. You can even check him in Wikipedia. He is very, very famous, not only in Mexico. He is very famous worldwide. He has even uh, painted like Alebrije type uh, um, Mercedes Benz. So, well, that I only wanted to share that uh, later after the exhibition and the conference with Linda and the scientist. We are going to Oaxaca to visit the Jaguar Reserve and also the reserve, the Copal Reserve. It's like the tree reserve where they do all these uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, artesanies. So, well, um, maybe it's going to be too much for you going to Sedona and to Omega, but in Mexico, you are also going to be welcome. And with time, I'm going, uh, we are going to invite you to, to this retreat. Well, um, I'm going to have these five sessions. Uh, the, the sessions, the first one in English, the, um, I'm going to also make it in Spanish. So uh, the, the, the Spanish one is going to be next Wednesday. And if you speak Spanish, no problem, you can, come in again and listen to everything in Spanish. And then I'm going to do it on Wednesdays, Wednesdays at five o'clock uh, p.m. 
Mexican time, it's going to be in English. And at seven, it's going to be in Spanish. So in this first episode, we are going to be speaking about the relation of the science with the different myths. And in the second session, we are going to speak about the different gods and how they transform themselves into different animals or how they have these animals as companion and what these animals, these specific animals really mean. We are today also speaking a little bit about Hercules, but Hercules has uh, it's a very, very vast mythology, very much surrounded through animals uh, and uh, uh, around animals because of his 12 labors. But that's not the only part of Hercules. Hercules is much more. He is a hero, a sun hero, and he has to go through this journey as if it's like the hero's journey. And he is always battling between good and bad, life and, and death, all these opposites. So uh, that's uh, even he with his incredible force and he being so, so tall, they say the in myth that he is... Uh, he was over two meters high, like two, six meters high. And well, that also had this problem with him, with this strength that he didn't control and how he made tantrums and what he, he how he developed with time and with, with all these aspects where he had to get into humility and to back for forgiveness and to be in service. So Hercules is that hero that has to be in service for humanity. And that's what we are going to be speaking. Then on the fourth session, I'm also in introducing nature like flowers, plants and agriculture, because Everything that has to do with nature is also has also to do with astrology. We in astrology, we have the hours, the seasons, everything. All the rituals and magic uh, are related to flowers and to uh, nature. So I think that is part of nature. And uh, the last one that's going to be like, I think... Um, the one that probably we are going to be uh, more interested in is not only, I'm not going only going to address the lions. The lion is very important, but also the jaguar and also, also the big cats and what it really means. And we are going to analyze this uh, solar energy uh, that represents um, the lion and the, the big cats, the big cats that are so important in nature, in our culture. And well, I hope you are going to um, subscribe. And well, here we are going to be. There is one, one week I'm going to skip on Wednesdays because we have death day. Death day, you remember, it's a very, very important day for us Mexicans. And that's why I'm I'm skipping from, from October. I'm going to the 8th of November and then to the 15th of November. That's going to be the last day that I'm going to be sharing these, uh, these episodes. And well, I hope you are going to enjoy it. So also that's uh, something that's very important for me to say is that um, the jaguar has to do with, uh, it's very, very much linked to the Mexican culture because it is Tezcatlipoca. Tezcatlipoca is the brother of Quetzalcoatl and Quetzalcoatl is the, the Venus. Venus. Venus is always next to the sun. So Tezcatlipoca, but Quetzalcoatl left it's very much related also to Venus, Aphrodite, and also to Jesus. Jesus left, but the Scatlipoca stayed. And that Scatlipoca is the one personifying the jaguar. The jaguar that's going 
to um, take us to reconsider what is good and bad in ourselves. Well, I hope you are going to enjoy also what I have to tell you about the Jaguar culture in Mexico. So I'm going to start. So we all know the zodiac or the so zodiac, and it 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 means real really the circle of little animals. But if we say animals, animals comes from anima, anima or animus, where Jung took these two words from to to representing or to specifically um, uh, naming the. Feminine energy in a man, that's anima, and animus, it's the masculine energy in a woman. And if we see the moon, the moon is, uh, if we see the sun, we divide it in two, and then we have two moons. One is going to mean anima, and the other, the animus, and it also has to do with soul. How do we get to our soul through animals? So the, the, the zodiac is the name given by the old pagan astronomers to a band of fixed stars about 16 degrees wide, apparently circling the earth. So it's so on. The circle is we have to move on. And in that way, it's also uh, our hero's journey that we are going to address through the myth of Hercules. And well, that's also. So in antiquity, the zodiac is much in dispute, but the zodiac must be ancient enough. What happened a few thousand years before the Christian era? What happened? All the shepherds, when they were in the evening looking at the skies, they they related to the stars and they they made up a mythology. If we see myth or mythology, mythology always is going to have something of truth and something like a fairy tale, but it's not a fairy tale, it's not a folk. Uh, folk uh, fairy tale, it's mythology always has to do with transcendence. It's a transcendence we are going to have through spirituality. So that is the myths that the shepherds say uh, when they were looking at the sky, they were saying, hey, listen, we have to transcend. What does this mean? So uh, that that is one. One, um, when we speak about primitive cultures, and sometimes we refer to primitive cultures as not being smart, as being people that didn't think, that's not true. That's definitely not true. Because we have these caves, uh, like the cave painting, where we have horses, we have the stars. They already were looking at the stars and having really this um, uh, connection to the, the, the nature, to the stars, and to these animals. Animals for them were very, very important. And when they sacrificed the animals, that's why I'm telling you about also this mythology around plants and flowers and agriculture, when they sacrificed an animal because they had to eat, they worshiped that animal and there were special rituals. And these rituals are represented in these caves, in these cave paintings that where we see horses, deers, buffaloes, and we see even uh, Arush, that's the bull, bull. And also there is going to be these um, representations of the stars. Here we have this um, Pascal uh, good look, you can look her up. And she made a very, very uh, thorough investigation about the paintings in, in the caves and how they have. So in the Lascaux Caverns, the bull room, Volkiewicz, uh, has these uh, these constellations uh, where she is going 
to, to, to recognize the different constellations. So here we have the, the, the Orion belt, here we have the Hyades, and here we have the Pleiades. So she already, and all of the belt of Orion with respect to Taurus. So they already drew Taurus, and it's incredible how they can, they could drew the, the, the bull, only with with clay and with blood they they mixed it so that's incredible so here's the constellation of arok the bull in relation to that of the lion so they they were always like interested in the lion in the sun too and this is uh how how she she drew it here is this and then at at when when she when you go out of the of the cave you can see on one side the horse that means uh, that is face up represents the sunrise so on one side she has the sunrise and on the other side is the sunset so she she the, there is this incredible uh, cave paintings where you can see that so also, one of the oldest calendars is going to be the moon calendar, where we are going to see the moon cycle. For them, the cycles were very, very important. So this is the first moon calendar they saw. And here's the first painting that saw, they saw about a goddess. Here, the goddess, you can see like these two triangles with the waist and well, the hat, the little hat there, that's also very, very cute. So they, they and the Neolithic uh, people, they were animistic. What does animistic really be, uh, mean? They believe that all the elements of natural world, mountains, rivers, stones, forest animals, had a divine being. So they worshiped everything every plant, every animal they sacrificed or ate, they were very conscious about what was happening. So the moon cycle was the simplest astronomical cycle for them to observe. They even found a lunar cal calendar that was this one in Serbia. Here, well, let me go. So the Greek mystics, on the other side, that they they believe that the spiritual nature of man descended into material existence from the Milky Way, the seed ground of souls. That's why I tell you that anima, anima, animals has to do with soul. Through one of the 12 gates of the great zodiacal band, the invisible in material spirit in wandering along the pathway of the stars and sequentially assuming in the course of evolution the forms of the sacred zodiacal animals. This I love. I think it's so beautiful to see the, the horse like here with a with soul, with the sun be, behind. I think it's incredible. So there are three main causes which have induced men to worship animals. As animals, so the animal as by itself was very important. The bull, the horse, each of these animals had a reason to be. As the dwelling place of gods, so the gods could change or transform themselves in these animals, and they were the caretakers. It's like what I told you about the Nahual. The Nahual for Mexicans is this animal that's called the guardian angel in, in a way of this newborn baby. So, or this person that's going to be uh, getting older with time. So, and as representative of tribal ancestors, what Maurice said about the white lions, also the jaguars. The jaguars are also these cats that are going to, uh, they are gods, they are uh, priests, they are shamans. Uh, in Mexico, the jaguar is all that too. 
the same as in Africa. I think Africa and, and Mexico has a lot in common in the way uh, the natives or the indigenous people relate to nature. For us, nature is always going to speak to us. It's part of the cosmogony of the indigenous people in Mexico too, not only for Africans, but I think we have a lot in common. So the animistic condition of mind sees in every natural object a living entity. If I have a spirit, why not the plants, trees, animals, and planets? The animistic evolution had three stages. First, we have the primitive, when people lived in caves, what I showed you, the barbaric belonging to a much more sophisticated civilization like the Aztecs, Greeks, Egyptians, Mayas, and Hindus, polytheistic religion. So for all these culture, if uh, even for us as astrologers, when our earth dies, our God die, gods die too. It's very different to see the world and our spirituality and the way we relate to cosmogony in this way. So we have to take care of our planets. planet. We have to take care of our flowers, of our plants. We have to be taking care all of our animals too. Where the supreme deity belongs to a monotheistic religion, that's Christianity, Judaism. Uh, so these religions, when, when the world dies, they are going to keep on being. So it's different. So the origin of the, zodiac, the zodiacal creatures, a popular theory concerning the origin of the zodiacal creatures says that they were product of the imagination of shepherds. That's what I told you. Watching their flocks at night occupied their minds by tracing the forms of animals and birds in the heavens. The shepherds were regarded in antiquity as the priest shepherds. So they were very important because they were really analyzing and watching nature. What was happening with animals? What was happening with the seasons? What was happening with the cycles of the planets? So everything was so, so important. So then at that time, the, the, the gods took the form of animals. So later it changed. But at that time, so the animals became the friends, helpers, and guides who are but gods themselves in beast form and receive divine homage as the animals in the zodiac wheel. These animals from the symbolic chart of the year known as the zodiac. So the Greek gods uh, took all forms of animal. We are going to see Zeus transform in, in a swan, in a, an eagle, so whatever. They are always going to be relating to one of the animals that's going to be more important because these animals with the Greek gods, uh, also with the Egyptian, also with, with the Mayas, also with the Aztecs, these animals are going to represent part of this energy of these gods. So they are going to transform themselves. So the, the Greek gods and animal form, many myths explore relationships between humans and animals. So we, there are even painters that you are going to see later that uh, have made a whole study about how uh, people and animals look. I'm sure you have seen that usually the dogs resemble the, the owners or they are people who have a very like Leo-like face. It has to do with the ascendant probably or a moon face too. So every, 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 it's, it's very important how one relates even more to one animal than the other. That's something that I, I've always like seen. Like dogs are very lunar. Cats are very solar animals, so it's it's different. Uh, I have seen in, in when people come to my place and they say, "Hey, listen, I am uh, allergic to cats." There are a lot of people who are allergic to cats, and I have to speak about that. And when I I analyze it more profoundly, 
these cats are so free and they want to be respected. Usually people who, who have like these allergies, uh, what I've seen or allergies to a dog or whatever, it's uh, like having a problem with specific character traits of that dog, that cat, the horse, whatever, because all animals are showing us something, like cats are showing us to be independent, to have respect. If you have a lack of respect to a cat, a cat is never going to be with you again. And a dog is always looking at you. It's a very, they are very, very lunar animals. They are always like, uh, following you or horses they are extremely sensitive when uh, horses are going uh, to 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 sense immediately what is happening with a person if a person uh, uh, has a problem with alcohol that horse is going to turn his back or whatever it's so funny to see how these um how how it happens so uh, Anthropomorphic suggests a rejection to the body. That's what I wanted to, to, to explain in this way. So the evolution of the idealized God, it changed later. As soon as nations grew and their wealth and power increased in importance. So what they changed is they put the animals next to the God. So the animals, the, the gods weren't transforming into this animal, or it was like this guardian animal that was next to this, this god that that was. So, and in Egypt, if we have this influence of Egypt, so we have to also analyze what is happening with a totem animal. The, uh, uh, the totem, uh, it is going to retain its special form instead of assuming a semi-human one. The animal or bird standing on the top of an Egyptian gnome, perch or standard is not intended for a fetish or a representative of a tribal ancestor, but for a creature which was regarded as the deity under whose protection the people of a certain tract or territory were placed. So we are have going to have Bass, the cat had it, Sebek, the incarnated crocodile, Ra and Horus, the hawk had, Hoth, the ibis had, Anubis, Jackal had. So in Egypt, we are going to see even like uh, where, where these animals were were in uh, were like there was a special ritual when they were then when they died and they were mummified. Why it's like the ibis head because it was related to Hermes or the cat. There are like these funerary temples full of cats because they related the cat to Bas. So these animals were considered as divine, symbolic in character. The Egyptian symbol for the soul, the Ba, is a man-headed birth. To the ancient Egyptians, the gods and goddesses were all around them and could be seen daily in nature. So for them, they were in nature. It's not the same in, in Mexico or in the Aztecs because we are going to have like three heavens. It's like, uh, it's more or less like in Greece, we have the Olympus, we have the earth, and we are going to have the Hades. So the earth is the place where gods and uh, humans can cohabitate. And uh, even earth is a place where the gods are going to fight one with each other in the Trojan War. So also we have that in, in, in the Aztec, um, cosmogony or also in the Mayan cosmogony where we are going to have three like three layer, layers and also if you go into this 
uh, uh, like the Hades, the, the, the ass, the Hades, they are going to be like nine levels. The, those nine levels are related to the, the shamanic um, ritual they have to go through. Well, that's on the side only. To the ancient Egyptians, the god and goddesses were all around them and could be seen daily in nature. So that was very important. It didn't mind if it was a, a bigger animal or a domestic animal or a wild animal. So they were all associated to the goddess and they could be seen. So here we have the different um, goddesses. I'm not going to get too much into this, because we are going to be much more into the, the natural phenomena of the Greeks and the Greek mythology. We are, as astrologers, so used to. So uh, we can today, with this rational mind and scientific mind, uh, you, uh, like modern people have, we really can't imagine how the, the people in the ancient times were really surprised about like an eclipse, like a uh, season changing, like the moon phases and the Venus cycle. In Mexico, the Venus cycle was so important. They they knew how, how long it took, when it was, and what happened. Well, they couldn't see the, the, the Cassini of the sun and Venus, but they knew it was there for them. Like the Cassini between Venus and sun was meant they were like Venus was uniting with God. So that... Uh, Later, the Spaniards came and they really wanted to, to fuse, make the syncretism that we are also going to see it in Greek culture and all cultures, we're going to see the syncretism. So the, the, the myth is going to originate from an experience in relation to nature that fills the human being with wonder, fascination, helplessness, a religious feeling that today we find difficult to understand because we have disassociated ourselves from it. For myth, Miller, myths are a poetic expression of a natural event. M Miller was the one that said that all cultures were related to the myth of the sun, that we are going to get much more into detail when we see the lion. So for the Stoics, it was very important because the most important animal was the bee. Why was the bee so important? Because the bee was a teacher for them. So uh, it, it was like the big animal or the bee queen, she wasn't able to kill anyone because she didn't have this thing. And what Stoics said is that the, the humanity should have the wisdom to learn to contemplate and acknowledge the divine and astrologers the same as bees. Be bring from uh, bring from the planets the creative and spiritual wisdom. So bees are also we are going to touch very much into the mythology of bees later on with industrialization. The 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 animal that was really important was the spider but not the bee, the bee, uh, the spider was always like working, researching, and it's, it's a different animal where they were uh, related. One of uh, the, the first son of, of Poseidon was Proteus, and he was the one who could always foretell the future but he didn't like to do it. So he always transformed himself into a different animal and only that person who really could catch him and hold him and uh, knew how to question exactly, uh, to, to ask for, for this answer. He really wanted to hear, but in a very clear way, then he transformed himself or, or also again into, uh, into this god, into this half god, half uh, fish. And when we see protean has, um, has this connotation, if we hear the word protean, of flexibility, versatility, and adaptability. So 
what, what does this have to do with mythology, with what I'm sharing with you, and that we have to see and we have to look at the historical point of view, the anthropological point of view, the psychological point of view, the scientific point of view, artistic, philosophical, and astrological. What is going to make from us very good astrologers to, to have in a way like culture and to know more about uh, everything, okay? So at that time, the, the elements uh, and the animals were also related to specific seasons. So, and to depending if they were, were hot earth animals or cold earth animals or air, air animals or water animals. And then you are also going to see in paintings later in the Renaissance, during the Renaissance, they are going to depict exactly what it meant. They are not going to randomly choose one animal or it has to do because in Renaissance, they were very interested in art. They were very interested in symbolism. They were really uh, very interested in all the Greek influence. So they were like reviving all, all what they, what, what the Greek, the, the, these smart, intelligent and forward thinking people had. So the earth animals are always going to be related to reptiles, to cats and elephants. The cold earth animals are going to be always to small or domestic animals, penguins and bears. Air animals to wild birds and water animals, well, to dolphins, whales, fishes, squats, whatever. So the signs were also related to animals and seasons. So we are going to have Virgo and Mercury. Mercury is going to be related to the harvest season and farm animals. Sagittarius to the hunting season represented by the arch and the arrow of the centaur. Capricorn Saturn when the sun starts its return to the north and the gold scales the north mountain. Aquarius, the winter raining season, and Pisces is always going to be related to fishing season. So whenever you see like the winter raining season, you are going to know they are going to be speaking about Aquarius. Okay. Or if you see the goat, they are going to speak about Capricorn or Sagittarius, when someone is hunting, that's going to be Sagittarius. So in paintings, that's also, it's really interesting. So interesting. So in spring, they are always going to be relating the dove, the sparrow, the migratory birds during spring, the woodpecker, the hummingbird, and the lamb. And during winter, we are going to see the bear, the wolf, the raven, and the, go and the goat. So here we are going to see this painting where we are going to see Amaltea. Here is a little Zeus. So you can think about which season is this painter talking about. What is this painter uh, Giordanos saying us about the season? The season is going to be like the Capricorn Caesar season where we are going to see like Zeus, the birth and of uh, his birth. So, um, so for example, this, this painting by Jacob Jordines represents the sun god Zeus being fed by the winter god Amaltea. Or another example is if we see a wolf and the lamb together being guided by a boy, that signifies the meeting between summer and winter during the spring equinox. The spring dove trans transformed itself into a raven during winter, or the spring lamb into a winter wolf or lion. So here we are going to have these animals represented. And so that's why I'm, I'm sharing this with you whenever you go to a museum or you see Renaissance paintings. So you can see the painting and the symbolism of that painting with totally different eyes. 
you are going to see the colors, you are going to see the symbolism and what it really means. So we have the Scorpion on Paris, the West, realization of a promise of glory that takes a person through an encounter with a passion. The Archangel John is there. Leo Regulus, North, the shadow personified by Angra Mainu, the destroyer takes the form of the desire for retribution. Be aware, but be aware of revenge. Archangel Marcos. Taurus Aldebaran, the manifested shadow of Angra Mainu, the destroyer is the challenge of maintaining moral integrity during a commitment. Archangel Lucas. Aquarius, Formahal, South, the shade is personified by Angra Mainu, the destroyer takes the form of bitterness and lack of spirituality. So these are the, 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 the things we have to be um, learning with through these royal stars that I'm sure that during the conference in, in Omega, they are going to address them much more deeply than I am. So the symbolic values represented in nature. So we have to see the plants, we have to see the animals, here are the quarters, and uh, to take, um, we, we can't take uh, on, we have to be, be, be careful how we relate to these seasons and what they really want to tell us. So even in astrology, we are going to, to divide the, the, the chart into quadrants. So what does it mean to relate these seasons to the different quadrants? We have the different signs that um, uh, I'm going to get a little bit into the mythology of each of these signs because these signs are going to be very related to an animal. The first two ones are the most uh, most important in a way. We are going to have also the Leo. The Leo, we, it's like a chapter by itself. We are going to be analyzing it. So uh, uh, here we are going to have this triangle in this Aries. It's going to be the first zodiacal um, sign so and we owe the ram the, the 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 symbol of the ram really to the egyptians but we're going to see later the high titas high tides are also going to be very much related to the golden fleece and why to the golden fleece because the high tides and the egyptians they uh, it was a very very ancient uh, culture in turkey what is uh, Turkey, uh, at the moment, uh, it's uh, they vanished. They don't know why, uh, how they vanished, but they had a huge fight with the Egyptians, and uh, they, but they were both the same uh, as strong. And at the end, it was the first peace tre treaties. So we are going to see that the Egyptians and the high Pitas had a great influence in the symbolism of the ram that uh, you're going to see. It's really beautiful. So the ram for the Egyptian also had a spiritual or religious function since it was considered a sacred animal for Amon-Ra that they associated with the sun. So we are also going to see Zeus ram. Zeus, uh, Zeus is also going to be represented with a ram. And the sun is exalted in Aries. The Greeks came to Egypt. They are part of Hellenism. Hellenism is already Roman. So Amon ram was a god of the sky, the sun, and the origin of life in Egyptian mythology. It represents the symbol of sunlight, in addition to being responsible for the cycle of death and resurrection. Resurrection. So it represents the midday sun. So it's the strongest sun, and uh, it's the cosmic representation of fire, too, from the first time, Morocco. Gautamon breaks with inertia, the first will of consciousness that is the initial spark initiates an expansive movement of God and little by little the consciousness expands. The strength of the ram is in the head, 
the male bulldozer of the head. Zeus, a moon, is linked to the idea of vitality, fertility, brutal drive. The solar disk is like Ra, which is also the ostia and when Amon is set. So we have the Zeus, Amon, Ra. You are going to see the horns that are going to get into it. Here, uh, this is the same as this Amon, Ra that also has these, and later they made the, these, these, okay? So when we look at the golden fleece, the golden fleece that's going to be very important for these Aries uh, myth, uh, the one, the first who, who said uh, something about this golden fleece and where it came from, it's what it was a genius. Uh, is the only one who says that Poseidon falls in love with Enofane. He takes her to an island and turns her into a sheep. And he becomes a ram and thus the golden fleece was born. So later in Frixo and Hela, we are going to see this uh, golden fleece that's going to save them from being sacrificed by their father and taking them to the Kolokai. I'm not going to get too much into this myth. It's a beautiful myth, but we we should, um, if we we go too deep into this myth, it's we're not going to be finished today. <laughs> so uh, here we're going to have the division between East and West. The Colochite is also uh, this part where magic comes. So for the Greeks um, and this part of Turkey too is, uh, from Turkey come everything that has to be has to do with magic. All this magic, Medea and Parsifal and Sibelis and even Apollo, they are all from that part where they are very much linked to this magic and the ritual. And on the other side, we have these great Greek cultures where they are much more rational. So there was this, this part where they were like separated. This myth about uh, Frixo and Hela is later and also Jason. It's it's a myth that uh, was later. So the, the Colochite is now Georgia. What is the blue is the Black Sea. For Carl Gustav Jung, the Golden Fleece is the conquest of what reason deems impossible. And we are going to find two elements, sacrificial victim, innocence, and in the golden color, the glory and the golden fleece between glory and innocence, because Hele is the one that falls in the sea. And it's the feminine energy that falls in the sea that has to be recovered. There is a great dream that still has the shine and the true wealth, the pursuit of glory. Pursuing money is to poor reaching. So the golden fleece, the pursuit of the golden fleece has to do with much more. It has to do with, with values, with other kinds of values. There is a relationship between the golden fleece and the quest for the grail, reaching for an item that brings profit. So here we have Hellesponto and where they fell, uh, uh, that the, the, this myth uh, is also uh, here that were here, this part, the, well, the stream goes upwards and over here it goes downwards. So that's something, well, but that's related to Frixo and Helle and to Jason too. So we have the Hypatai hypothesis. So it's the mythology of the Old Testament that when, how the, they originated and where they came from. Hattusa, the empire of Hattusa is the empire that has this, uh, the entrance of this Hattusa has these two lions too that are important. And here we have the first treaties of peace that were between Egypt and Haitats. But why am I going into this? Because they had um, a god 
that's the Lipinu. This god is related also to, to Inanna, to Persephone, to Dem Demeter, to Demophon, to, to all of these. So every nine years, it's the cycle of nine, remember? Uh, they had a, a very extravagant uh, festival where 1,000 sheep and 50 oxen were sacrificed as the symbol of the god. And the oak was replanted. So they had this oak tree that uh, where they uh, hang this golden fleece. What does this have to do with uh, Aries or with Christianity? Or so this golden fleece was hanged there. It meant that um, and when we uh, celebrate Christmas and we put like these golden uh, like uh, like adornments, how do you say adornments? Or, or, or what is going, we are going to be hanging on the tree. It means this, it means the glory. How are we going to look for this glory? So uh, the, the sacrifice of the ram where the golden skin is rescued and hangs from a tree and the serpent or a dragon appears to watch over it. The same as with the myth of Inanna. We are going to have also this tree that Inanna wants her, her bed made from it, and this serpent that is going to be taking uh, guide, uh, guarding the, the, the tree. The same happens with, with Jason, uh, with the Argonauts too, the same happens. Is this serpent, this dragon that's get, taking care of this golden fleece? Uh, so we are going to continue with the preparation of the Argonauts trip. And the difference is that to survive the trip, you have to be prepared. So when we make our trip through the signs, so we have to be prepared. Teseo's maze is what the fleece is to the meat of Jason and the function of the golden fleece. Here we have a relationship between the golden fleece and the quest for the grave, which is to reach the object that brings profit. This defunctionism is a theory that explains the similarities from which there was a contact between these cultures. Conquests and commercial exchanges in this myth, myth between Greek and Russian culture. Jung and Durand assure that the myths are very similar and that images are inherited and that we are already born with that image and with the predisposition to form it. We have the myth of Isaac and that of the children of the Golden Fleece where we clearly see diffusionism. So here we have the tree. We have Hatusa. We have uh, the two lions again, and how the lion is very much related to our hero's journey. That's why Hercules is the, the first labor in Apollodorus that um, Hercules is going to do is this uh, with, with the, the lion. Well, Hercules is really going to kill two lions, not one, it's two. They say the first one is another, but I'm going to explain it the other. So the sun and Aries is also very much linked in, uh, in, in mythology. Also, we are going to have here the Sphinx. We are going to be speaking also about the Sphinx uh, in, in the upcoming episodes. So this is also going to be important. So we are going to have these similarities between cultures that we have to know uh, when we relate to the different mythologies of the, the, uh, of the different cultures and how the, the syncretism is going to speak about many things. So when we celebrate Christian, uh, Christianity in Easter, where the resurrection of the soul is honored after death. Remember, Aries has to do with this part, honoring the honor after death. 
It represents the victory of the spirit over the body. It is always celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon in spring. So the Christmas tree is related to the high tides. So if we hang something on a Christmas tree, that is going to be the golden fleece. So uh, as a large circle and reaches an immobile point, you are already one in a movement like the top spinning at high speed. All evolutionary paths are associated with the symbols of the spiral. The sacrificed lamb is associated with the ram because it represents the sun. The sacrificial lamb is the fire of sacrifice. They are energetic links. The ox, like the lamb, in a pejorative sense, is a domesticated energy. The sacrifice of the ram, where the golden skin is rescued and hangs from a tree, and the serpent or a dragon appears to watch over it. So we here we have a Frixon Helle. When Frixer arrives in the Colochite, he is going to sacrifice this ram to Mars. Then we are going to have Taurus. Taurus is the second. It's also very, very important in our culture. It's going to be, uh, it represents the bull from Earth. And the constellation is going to be closely linked to Zeus again by the large number of myths that uh, revolve around his life. One of the myths tells us about his conversion into a bull to seduce mortal Europe. So he is going after Europe, he's going to see her. Uh, she is with all the cows, uh, with her brother. In That's also very important in an Asafran um, Valley. Asafran is everything that's yellow is honey, beer, asafran, saffron. Everything is going to be related to the sun. So he is coming, coming, he is seducing her, and he is taking her with her, with him. So another myth that's uh, very interesting and very important, it's Mitraism. They say that Mitra, if it wasn't because of Christianity, Mitra or Orphism would be very important. So here we have uh, related also this myth of Mitra. Mitra is um, um, a ritual also, uh, a, a kind of religion too. Uh, it has the ceremonies too about sacrificing the, the bull and from the bull, uh, like life was be born. So sacrifice has a lot to do. Here we see the dog, here we see the snake, here we see the scorpion, all of them like uh, uh, feeding themselves, like nature feeding from the, the blood, blood meaning uh, like life and death. Again, we are going to have this life and death. And if we see Mitra here, like sacrificing the bull, he's really not seeing at the bull. He's seeing at the sun. Here's Helios. He's going to be see Helios and Selene. Here we have Paul. Here we have like the um, um, grain, the um, Demeter grain. How do you say it? Well, the sprout always. And he is uh, the sun. Helios is giving him the, the sign how to uh, sacrifice the bull. So if he holds the bull with his hands here, he's not really uh, in a very uh, like aggressive or violent. The bull is letting himself be sacrificed. So we are going to have the patterns, the poor, the two patterns. It's like the the guardians of the different uh, like doors. One is the last door and the other is the first door where these initiates are going to be getting in. These initiates are going to be military. The, the blood of the bull meant to give them like strength to be able to, to, to fight. And it was only for men. All the other rituals like Sibele, like Demeter, uh, all the others were 
uh, women and men were uh, could go into these rituals, but not with Mitra. With Mitra, it was only like this. There are going to be different levels. We are going to see here the moon, Mercury, Jupiter, all these. But when these men came here in the middle of this uh, initiation process, they had, they they became, uh, they they put a honey in their mouth and to guard their uh, words. It was very important for them to be guarding the, 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 the words. Most of them only came to this level, not to the other. So we are going to see a, a crow is also present and sometimes a cup and the small lion. We're going to see the lion too. The, the torch bearer causes the cautopates, it's these two, the celestial twins of light and darkness are placed on both sides with their legs crossed. Cautus with this mark pointing upwards and Cautopates with his down, the uh, own down. So this one was more related to Saturn. Above Mitra, the symbol of the sun and moon are present in the starry sky. It has been proposed that Starro Ta Tauroctony is a symbolic astrological representation of the constellations rather than Iranian animal sacrifice seen with Iranian precedent. The bull is Taurus, the snake Hydra, the dog Canis, major or minor, the crow or co crow Corvus, the crater cup, the Leo lion, and the wheat blood for the star Spica. Torch bearers may represent the two equinoxes, although this is not so clear. Cautus, the summer, the gateway of humans, and Cautopates, the winter, the door of the gods. Mithras himself could also be associated with Perseus, whose constellation is above that of the bull. So Perseus of all the gods, you're going to see that Perseus and Heracles uh, come from the same lineage. So they are the two heroes. So Perseus by itself is the hero in uh, the, the, the hero. So even though the Mithraic initiation was only for men, here we see Nikes, female winged figures holding the bull in the same way as in the sacrificial rite of Mithra. So here we have these angels ha ha holding the, the same way as they used. Here we have Europe, the one who was ca captivated from Suez. She is the, he took her to Crete, crammed her to Ke Crete. And here we have, they had like these children, Minos, Radamon, and Sarapedon. These three children uh, were very important because these were the children who really introduced the law, the law in, in the Hades. So uh, Zeus also give, she, he is going to give her several gifts in addition to the children, a collar made by Hephaestus, a kind of robot talos, a dog capable of taking care of her and the javelin. Asterion, king of Crete, married her and adopted her children. Cadmus, Harmony's future husband, seeks her out, but the Oracle of Delphi tells him to return and found Thebas. The Cretan lineage is given due to the union, union of a human with a divine. Here, uh, the, the way that Zeus is always going to be having these unions with humans is going to be important even for Heracles it's going to be very important because <clears throat> they the Titans uh, to they there was a, a battle between the Titans and the gods and um, to be able the the oracle had uh, had said that to to be able to to really conquer the Titans or the monsters uh, he had to have a uh, half human child. That's why Her Heracles was born and he was this huge, big uh, hero, uh, almost uh, god monster. Well, 
that that's the figure of Heracles. So the three brothers have the right to reign over Crete, but as Minos wants to keep the throne, he has asked Poseidon to help him in a campaign to define who stays with the kingdom. So the three first, the three brothers are going to first uh, uh, have a rivalry because they three fall in love with someone and well, um, uh, Sarpedon, he leaves, and only Minos and Radamentus stay, but he wants to stay, so he asks Poseidon for a favor, and Poseidon is going to give him this white bull. This white bull, uh, he, he, Poseidon tells him, you know, you have to sacrifice this bull, but he doesn't sacrifice the white bull. So, what does the sacrifice really mean in, in, in for, for a Greek culture? So even for the Aztecs. So uh, when you see the story of the Aztecs, you say, oh, how terrible was this? But you have to understand what it really meant or what was behind the culture. So there were two sacrifices, so bloody and bloodless. So when the latter consisted of vegetable objects and the former in former in animals, but there is a symbolic meaning. So if there was a, 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 a for a male, the sacrifice that was for a male, they they they, they were were sacrificed bulls, and if they were female, they were sacrificed cows. So that was for Hera. So it was very different. So the sacrifice of, of a domestic animal, bull, cow, goat, pig, was considered the sacrifice by excellence. What did it mean, really? It is the moment when the division between men and gods was remembered while they were reunited. So with, with the fire, and so they re reunited, and they, they gave to the gods the bones, the bones, why? The bones were the important part because they are going to stay. The meat, they are going, that's that's only for a limited time while the meat is still fresh. For the myth of Prometheus, the liver will have a great importance since according to Booker, it was the channel aggression and thus favor altruistic values. That's also the Prometheus. We are going to see it more closely during the Hercules myths. So here is uh, Parsifae. Uh, there it's Daedalus. Daedalus is the architect and, and Poseidon is angry and he is going to tell uh, Parsifa is going to fall deeply in love with this bull. So she asks Daedalus, the architect, to make this bowl, and she's going to get in there. And so the Minotaur was born, and then we are going to have this labyrinth where uh, Daedalus is going to build this labyrinth. And at the end, Daedalus uh, and his son, they are going to be in the labyrinth because Minos is going to be very angry that he made this cow for Parsify, and Parsify had this Minotaurus. But what, what is this part very, the great mother? Taurus always has to do with a great mother. And we have this astronomical, um, uh, well, an archaeological a site that was uh, discovered not very long ago, Catalhuyuk is called, is where here we have the goddess who is giving birth to the bulls, but she always is going to have these two lions, one on each side. So Catalhuyuk was uh, built underground, and what these people did, they buried their dead in their home. So they cohabited tighted with the, the death in their uh, in their same place. So the great mother is also going to be related to Sibele. Sibele also comes from this magic part from Russia. Remember, Russia, Georgia, Turkey, all these parts where there were so many um, 
was so much magic. So on one side, she was accepted. And on the other side, she really wasn't that accepted. Later on, she was uh, assimilated to Rhea and to, to other goddesses. But she had a very special ritual because she fell in love with Atis. And when she, oh, wait, let me see. Right. Oh, then I have it here. Oh, what did I do? Okay. Well, I have to explain it to you because I, I don't know. Oh, here. Here it's in English? No, here it's in English. No, not? Oh. Oh, I didn't. Sorry. Well, I'm not going to explain it. What did Sibelis do? She fell in love with Atis, and uh, they promised each other they, that they would never be unfaithful. Later, Atis was unfaithful. She got, like, very angry, and he got so ashamed that he he took away uh, his, his sacrifice, his manlyhood he his gen genitals he he put them away so so that he couldn't be unfaithful anymore so what they did in this sibele is like more or less the same as with mitra they sacrificed a bull and here underneath is this guy and the the blood fell on top of this so this this the, the blood of this was this meaning that he got strength, the strong vitality, and that was important. So the, the Sibela um, ritual wasn't that nice because at the end, men castrated uh, themselves. So it was really difficult. But there is this story between Sibele and the two lions that I'm never going to, if you see the sculpture of Sibeles here, these two lions are never going to be facing one to each other. They are always going to be facing to the other side. So what uh, that meant, there was Atalanta, that sometimes she is related to Diana, but um, he, Hippomedes fell in love with her, but there was always a race. And she said, well, the man who is going to win me, he is the one I'm going to be with him. So Hippomedes knew that and asked Aphrodite to help him to conquer Atalanta. So what Aphrodite did, she gave him three apples, golden apples. And while he was like running, he threw these apples. So Aphrodite, the Atalanta pick them up on purpose. She really liked hypodamus and, well, both. At the end, well, they fell deeply in love, but they made love in the temple of Sibele. Sibele got so angry that she uh, transformed them into these two lions, and these two lions could never see each other. Dionysius is also a, a god that always is related to these fierce um, uh, uh, cats, tigers, lions, all these uh, uh, predators, what they say predators, or these uh, animals they are that are very, very much linked to the instincts. So Dionysius and Sibelis are also very much uh, related because they say that Dionysius in all the rituals of Sibelis, he was taking part of it because of the relation they both had with the lions and the tigers. The lady of the snake that's in Creek, that's here we again see this feline and she with these two serpents looking up. So uh, the, the bulls, they instead of really sacrificing the bulls, the bulls had like a dance where the, the, the men who were going to have like this love or sex with these women that were very sensuous, they, they had to be able to really 
uh, to 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 be conquering the bulls. So here the the two snakes that are related to transformation again, and here the cat that's also related to this matriarchal culture. Uh, it's the strength that's going to give uh, the women. So here we have. Uh, Bromius, uh, uh, Dionysia Bromius, also with these animals, these savage animals, because in the rituals of Dionysius, Dionysius is the most human of all gods, and Heracles is the most, is the god between humans. So, Dionysius and Heracles, Dionysius and Sibelus are going to have very much in common and it's very much related, the same as Dionysius with Sibele, uh, because of this uh, initiation process that, uh, and the mysteries, bacantes, uh, it means that, that you have been initiated. So with Dionysius, with Bacchus, he also the wine is very much related to him. And one of the nice stories about this is that he sees a little plant and he, he, he picks it up and then he sees the little bone of a little bird. And he is going to put this plant in this little bone, but the plant is growing and growing and growing. And then what he is going to find is going to find the bone of a lion. And then he is going to transfer this plant into the bone of the lion. And But again, the plant is, is growing and growing and growing. And then at the end, he has to take it up and he sees a donkey. And with this donkey, he puts again the, the flower and this uh, grapes, this wine flower, uh, it starts to grow. And then he says, well, there is this problem. When you drink too much, when you drink, first you are going to be happy as a bird and sing like a bird. If you drink a little more, then you are going to be, uh, you are going to have like this courage and you are going to look for trouble. But if you drink too, 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 too much, then you are going to become a donkey. You're going to become like a little, uh, well, so. Then we have in classical Gemini, we are going to have the, 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 the myth uh, related to Lida and to Castor and Pollux and to Helen of Troy. And there are uh, many, um, two versions, not uh, only about Lydia having these four children, but the one is that Zeus and Gaia uh, have a uh, um, a talk because Gaia is really very angry because of the irreverence of humans. Humans are not acknowledging nature. They are really um, unrespectful, drinking a lot and having parties and parties. So she gets very angry and she says, well, so, so I think you have to uh, make like a flood or something. And, uh, but then comes Momo, the daughter of Nix and says, Oh, I have a much, much better idea. You, why don't you uh, create the most beautiful woman on earth? And this is going to uh, make a, a war. A war is going to happen through this beautiful woman. Oh, well, Sue so says, well, it's not a bad, bad idea, really. Then he, he sees... Uh, um, he 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 says, "Well, whom am I going to seduce? Who is really going to be the one who is going to give this nemesis, this revenge, to the the lack of respect to nature?" So nemesis, Zeus um, um, goes after nemesis. Nemesis, nemesis this. Uh, uh, it's like this avenger of crime and the punisher of hubris. So he goes after Nemesis, but Nemesis doesn't want to. And she transformed herself into a bird. And then she says, well, what a problem. I'm going to transform myself into a swan. So they have a child. 
and she ha she lays an egg, but she doesn't want that egg and puts it out on the shore. And then came come uh, a shepherd, and this shepherd is going to 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 pick up this uh, egg. But meanwhile, Zeus also had this relationship with Leda. And Leda is therefore going to have Castor and Pollux and Clytemestra. And like this shepherd put this egg over there, uh, uh, the four children are going to be born. And King Tindarus is going to adopt all, all four children. But what is the meaning really of the egg? The symbolic terms of the egg represents unity before unfolding in different polarizations. Usually when we see the relationship between twins in mythology or brothers in mythology, there's always going to be unfolding polarity and even like death from one to another brother. Like when Castor and Pollux also when uh, one dies, the other wants also to be with, with him or with Romulus and Ramos also. Uh, and we are always going to see this, um, this polarization also with Helena and Clitemestra, uh, both of them, uh, Clitemestra uh, is the origin of the Orestiada because she at the end is going to kill Agamemnon. But well, uh, that's a story on the side, but it's really interesting to see Gemini, this polarity in Gemini. With Cancer, we are going to have the interpretation. Uh, also, again, about Heracles, the, um, the cut, when he was cutting each of the heads of, of Hydra, that each of them represents part of the shadow that we as person have. And well, he steps on, on, on this crab and Hera is going to place this crab in the sky. <clears throat> the dog star Sirius or Otis, that's also going to be always very, very close to the moon. Here is the shepherd dog was a type of priest crab. The dog's ability to sense and follow unseen persons for miles symbolizes the transcendental power by which the philosopher follows the thread of truth through the labyrinth of earthly error. So <clears throat> the dogs, here's what I told you that many times dogs, the type of dogs you have are going to be very much related to the face or the energy of the owner. So the, the lion being the king of the uh, animal kingdom, here's again, we are going to have again Theseus and Heracles. And here we are going to go much deeper when we see Heracles and all the myths. So, uh, but there's a very, very beautiful myth around the lions. It's that the parents of Pyramus and Tisbe prevented the union. They didn't want the union to be happening. They met up, but they, like Romulus and Juliet, Romeo and Juliet, they, they made up uh, <clears throat> a meeting in the forest, in the Blackberry Forest. And when young Tisbe arrived, there was no one. She waited and then a lion came. She saw a huge lion appear which made her flee without picking up the veil on which she sat to wait. Pyram Pyramus arrived and saw the veil and he thought that she, she, she was already dead or eaten by this lion. And then he took his own life. Uh, this returned later and she no longer saw the lion, but the young Pyramo lying under the black his blood staining the white blackberries, he also took his life. Zeus took the veil of Tisbe and placed it between the stars. It is the constellation of the ground, crown Berenice located next to the Leo constellation. Here we have Helios, Apollo with the horses too that are going to be leading. Usually the white horse and the black horse have uh, a special symbolism where all the horses with the colors are going to have. That's something we are going to be seeing later. 
And <clears throat> the lion is the king of the animal family, and like the head of each kingdom, is sacred to the sun. So, <clears throat> so we are going to choose this uh, symbolism of the lion also. That's why Heracles, when he sacrificed or killed this lion, he killed it with his bare hands. He didn't want the presence that Athena or all the other gods were giving him. He fought with the lion with his hands because he wanted to make the, the force and the vitality and the energy of the lion his so he could go through all the other 12 labors. In so we are going to have different mysteries. So we already spoke about Mithra. We already spoke about Sibele, and we have this very important mystery about Demeter. And she is going to, although we have like a person here, a woman here, a goddess here, a virgin here, she is going to be related to Demeter. And she's also going to be related to the piglets and also to the serpents. What does that mean in this <clears throat> in this myth? First, she she the abduction of her daughter um, from Hades uh, makes her like uh, reclude and makes her like say, well, the agriculture is not going to be uh, like flourishing or we are not going to have uh, these sprouts or corn or bread or whatever, no food. So she was very angry, but she um, starts this mysteries of the Eleusis. These mysteries are going to be held in two seasons that are going to be important. And well, it's going to, revive these initiation processes, okay? Um, that's also very long. That's why I'm not going to get too deep into it. But while she uh, is searching for her daughter, Poseidon falls in love with her. And she he is going to have um, this this relation, the horse, because first Poseidon was the, the god of the horse. And what Poseidon is going to do, so is going to shake the earth through due to its relationship with Demeter. So it is uh, associated with the tremors. So whatever Pisces or Neptune, well, it's not soft. They, they are always going to make tremors the same as uh, Poseidon made tremor the, the earth. So here is this uh, relation also. The mythical horse named Arion and her sister Hera. Arion is the mythical horse that rode uh, Hercules. Later, we are also going to see Hercules. So what uh, later Demeter has his black Phyllis priestesses that uh, were like these black horses that she had and that it was related also to Poseidon. So Poseidon and Demeter, when we, we analyze myth, we are always going to analyze them together. Uh, uh, the, uh, that's important. So during the, the mysteries, uh, the proclamation of the Bohedorios, there was uh, the, 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 the people had to start their mystery with a little piglet. And they had to get into the, 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 the sea. Uh, this, this part, the mistas to the sea, the mistas had to go to the sea. The mistas is the name for the initiations. And um, it was a very dangerous sea. It's not, uh, um, uh, it wasn't a tranquil water. M many of them drowned there with their piglets. Well, the ones who survived with their piglets during this initiatory uh, mysteries, they had to throw the piglets in here where there were a lot of serpents. 
happens. This, uh, it, it meant like the purification. So Demeter is always going to be related to these two or the great goddesses. If we see these goddesses in Crete with their uh, snakes also holding them, that meant transformation. So what I want you to to acknowledge is that going through the different signs really means how am I going to transform myself? So Libra is the only one that's not going to be related to an animal, but it is it is in a way because we are going to have two goddesses that are going to be related to Libra. First, we are going to have Temis Matt, that uh, she is going to speak about the the human wisdom and how we are going to to have have this wisdom that mean these scales mean that and govern. And the second wife of of or the first wife of Zeus, that's Metis, and she was this nymph that could, could transform oceanic, sorry, that could transform herself in whatever she wanted. There are two versions. One is that Zeus was afraid that the children she would bear would conquer him. And the other, uh, and then she he asked her, hey, listen, I want you to transform herself in a little drop of water. And I, are you sure you can do that? And she said, yes, of course. And he swallowed that drop. But the other is that he told her to transform herself into this little tabanus. And this little tabanus, then he took it and also swallowed it. And well, then uh, met this, he integrated the energy, the woman energy, the feminine energy into himself. Okay, so uh, the difference between Zeus and Cronus uh, or Uranus, Uranus and Cronus were afraid of the feminine energy. Zeus said, no, I need this feminine energy to make it mine so I can conquer. So that's the difference between Cronus. Cronus being afraid of his children uh, being more than he was. Then we have the Scorpio. The Greeks saw here a Scorpion, especially the one that mortally wounded or Orion. Orion was this um, also this um, warrior, and he was also the hunter. And well, Artemis was also a little love in in love with him, but Artemis and Apollo uh, had uh, they didn't let each of them to have a relationship. So one of these myths tells about uh, Orion, like wanting to hunt all the animals and Artemis got angry also with Gaia. But the other one is that Apollo told Orion, hey, listen, do you, can you swim very, very, very far over there? And he said, yes, of course I can. And then he told uh, Artemisa or Diana, Hey, listen, you are a very good hunter. You are very good with your arrow or your, 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 um, how to say, spell, your, well, you, 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 you are very, very good in hunting. So do you see this little point over there? Can you hit that point? And she said, oh, of course. Well, she, she killed Orion. And Orion, well, then was part of the stars. This is, this is an astronomical myth of the Hellenistic and Roman period when Christianity condemned myths on each supposedly the gods fled to the stars. So Christianity for them was better to say the gods are fleeing to the stars. So when the constellation of Scorpio, when the constellation of Scorpio uh, rises that of Orion Heights, hence the belief that the Scorpio followed Orion. Because Gaia also had the Scorpio bit Orion and then he died. That was the other, uh, that's the other myth. He hunted in Crete with Artemis and Leto when he boosted that he could kill any animal of earth. 
Lea, Gaia was offended and set a scorpion to sting him, but Leto and Artemis managed to immortalize him in the stars. So here we have different, uh, different myths and well, uh, that happens in mythology. You have to see like this protean part from one side on the other. Here we have Chiron that we are also going to address much more deeply in uh, in the Hercules uh, 12 labors because Hercules is going to be fighting with Nessus uh, and because they are drinking and he is going to, uh, with this poisonous arrow, hit on uh, this um, leg, this uh, Chiron leg. And so he he he's, he's going to be like, uh, not being able to heal himself, although he heals everybody. So later, uh, he Heracles, um, uh, well, uh, Zeus is going to, to take pity on him and grant that him death to deliver him from his suffering. So here we are going to go much much deeper because of the the myth that it's related to Prometheus to. Chiron and to Heracles that are going to be. So here Chiron, son of Cronos in Philia, we are going to have two kinds of centaurs. Uh, and this is a good centaur and the other centaurs are the children of Ixion and um, the, the cloud, it's called, um, not nebula, it's called, uh, oh, sorry. Well, uh, uh, these other centaurs are not good, Nessus and all the other centaurs that are born from this uh, union, okay? Because Ixion uh, was having, like flirting with Hera, Zeus got angry and he transformed uh, Hera, uh, a cloud in the image of Hera, and so Ixion had this relationship, and then the centaurs were born. Here also, we also have, again, like these images from people who love horses, and usually they look a little bit like horses, again. So here's the myth. I'm not going to tell it that much, because we are going to go much deeper into this myth with Prometheus too, that uh, with the liver and Prometheus is going to give the Titans, Prometheus and Atlas are the both that are going at the end, going to give very, very special myths, uh, uh, gifts to, to the world through Heracles, through these 12 labors that he has to do. So then we have Capricorn. That's a nice myth related to Capricorn. Uh, it's the 10th zodiacal sign. So Capricorn represents uh, the, the cardinal signs and the winter or summer. Uh, so um, here we have Pan and we have also the nymph Diope. And there were this, this fight between the, the Titans against the gods and the gods had to transform themselves in different animals and pan had to rescue <coughs> sorry had to rescue zeus and he was so long in the water that at the end he was transformed in this uh, capricorn this goat half goat half fish so uh, that's the the story behind this this story then we have also Amaltea. Amaltea is also very important. Amaltea is this um, um, cabra. It's going to be this uh, the, this this goat that's going to be feeding Zeus, and one of the horns is going to fall off the the horns, and Amaltea Amaltea is going to fill this horn. This uh, 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 with with flowers and fruits and everything, and is going to give it as a present to to Sue, so he can be fed with that. So um, 
So this is the, 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 the myth that's also going to be related to this. So in this context, Almatea means the beginning of the god par excellence, saved by the female care of the nymph or fed by the milk of the goat. In any case, a promising horn of abundance. So every time when we see a horn of abundance or we put it in our uh, rituals, uh, Table, so that's going to be important. Sinosura is also related to the Orsa Minora because Sinosura was the 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 Oriare uh, the, that that fed Zeus, and well, Zeus transformed her into Diosa Minora. And then we have another myth related to Capricorn with Pan and his flute. So he was after a nymph. And the nymph didn't want to have anything to do with him. So, uh, and he 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 transformed her. Uh, he did uh, so. He transformed her into this um, this stick, and he later transformed that into a flute. And this is why Pan is always like going to be such a good musician. Pan always uh, has also a relationship with, with panic. It also has a relationship. There is a very, very good book about uh, James Hillman about Pan, where he analyzes the relation, the, the relation between Pan, this devil that's related to the tarot, and Jesus. So I really recommend you to read that book. Aquarius, we have Ganymede. He was a Trojan prince, beautiful Trojan prince, uh, the only male. But the, the important thing here is that Zeus transformed himself into an eagle to uh, abduct Ganymede. And later, Ganymede was the one who was instead of Ga uh, Hebe, Hebe, the one who was the, the, the cup uh, bearer of the, the sign of Aquarius. And at the end, I'm going a little quick so you don't, you're not tired. So Pisces, what happened? Here's again the Python war and uh, the Venus Aphrodite uh, goes into the water with his uh, with her son Eros or Venus and Cupid for for the Romans. And she she is changed by Athena to these two fishes, and later uh, uh, Athena puts them on the as a constellation. And here we have the constellation of Pisces, that also means the Vesica Vesica Pisces, one fish looking upwards, the other fish looking downwards. I think that's part of the challenges of the Pisces. So the other one is that an egg was thrown into the Euphrates and was carried to the shore by two fishes. According to this legend, from the egg was born the goddess Venus, who placed the constellation of Pisces in the, sta in the sky as a thank you. And with this, I want to thank you for this long session today. Thank you very much for being with me and hopefully you are going to be with us the next time. <laughs> Thank you. Very rich. And you speak very fast. I speak very fast. Oh, <laughs> yes. There's Sorry. a lot here to unpack. And, you know, I think it's, you know, it's, it's the kind of uh, dive that requires five sessions just on this, right? <laughs> just on the 12 signs. Yes. So thank you again. Uh, I have a, maybe so we can take some questions if yes, of course. some of the attendees have anything to ask or share. You know, we need uh, to- Do you want me to, thing. okay. You want me to let you share, okay. I have a quick question uh, in okay. the meantime about Pan 
and Capricorn. Okay. You know, we know how Capricorn is about order and responsibility and serious things. And Pan is the satire who is about sex and rock and roll. Um, and we often see Satan also, you know, with the horns of Pan. How, how do you reconcile those discrepancies? The, the Satan. Well, in Tarot, when you have and the Pan. devil, yes, and Pan, Pan is related in the Tarot to the devil and Pan and Capricorn. So Panic, the name Panic, I'm panicking, comes from Pan too. And being afraid, uh, always when the devil comes out, it's like something you do not want to acknowledge about yourself. You are like uh, with this um, change, chains, uh, like you are chained because like guilt and, and, and being afraid are the two forces that do not let you um, go forward. And Capricorn has to do with this part also. It's like, I'm afraid. When we go into the mythology of Saturn too, Saturn, why does he eat his children? He eats his children because he is afraid that the children grow and he wants to bear them in his own belly. That's from a young young. Well, they all of... did that. You know, Uranus killed his kids, Kronos, Zeus, you know, they were not very well. Zeus, he did something different. He ate the women, he ate uh, Metis. He integrated that feminine energy in himself. Mm. So for me, the devil, sometimes it's like panicking or being afraid of of this part mm. uh, this book of james hillman is very interesting because he's going to be analyzing this figure of of christ and christianity and what they um they uh they were afraid of sexuality because there is also a myth called Dryopos. Dryopos in in related to pan it's like this energy that's um it's like a man who is afraid of be being homosexual and is going to have the 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 relationship with a woman of of his friend it's like this triangle and things like that so that's something that's it's explained mm -hmm. in the union theory too it's the, the myth of the Airbus or Pan. So well, I think... for me, Pan, you think? Go ahead. No, tell me, tell me, tell me. Tell I mean, me. I think that as a Capricorn, when we try to do to be so good and we repress our emotions, our sexuality, uh, trying to you know, uh, transcend those basic needs, it leads to a shadow. And that's maybe Pan also representing, you know, our closet. Yes. Like you say about the homosexual, you know, who had to live, you know, in the closet. So I guess that's related to that. In, in mythology also, all these animals that are half human and half animal have a problem with their instincts. Mm. That's what we're going to address the next time. They have this, this, this problem of um, getting in touch with, with their instinctive part, which is also pan, because if you see pan, it's the, the, the goat and the fish or the man and the and the and, and the goat so it's like this and then we also have this but pan as, himself was not pan as a as a being no. was very free so to speak free 
And well, it it has to do with this part also of the opus and how to get in touch with their uh, instincts, how to uh, have a, a harmonize or be in equilibrium with their instincts too. Thank and you. we have the, the Saturnalia's feast and parties were in, in December, everybody took off their masks and well, they, they made everything, but that's also this meaning. And sometimes what I've seen is sometimes, uh, well, the earth signs, sometimes they want to be so proper that they have a, a lot of hidden stuff. <laughs> exactly. That's that's the closet. The closet, yes. So Beautiful. Thank you. A well, lot to think about. A lot, you know, you, you kind of bring our curiosity <laughs> a lot of these myths. Oh, Any question yeah. from anyone? The devil, Julia says, the devil inside, the devil you know, like the tarot card. Yes, of course. It has to do so, with the devil. Yes, absolutely. And so, Ursula, how do people sign up for the next classes? I'm I'm going to post it in the Facebook. But we need it from the video because those who are going to watch the video need to know. Okay, you have I sent it email, to you. Yes, email. I, and we we sent it to them. Yes, what of it, course. But now for the video, <laughs> what is your email? <laughs> my my email is you are doctor. Um, arroba. How do you say arroba in English? At at uh, yahoo.com. So let me write this down. Oh, I can write it better. Uh, write it. No, I'll write it for the screen. Uh, so your name, Ursula? My name is, I already. Okay. Did you type it? Yes. Ursdoctor <laughs> at yahoo.com. So I'm going to share my screen, show it to everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And yeah, looking forward to the next one. Everything. <laughs> to the next one. Thank you very much for, for being here, Julia. I'm very honored that you are here. I send you all my love to all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Blessings. Bye-bye. Bye. See you.